Welcome to Lesson 6C, Linear Momentum, Moving Control Volume. In this lesson, we'll discuss the linear momentum equation for a moving control volume and do some example problems. We previously talked about the linear momentum equation for a fixed control volume. We used the Reynolds transport theorem. For a moving or deforming control volume, the main difference involves use of a relative velocity instead of the actual velocity in this term. We use it in this term only, not in the other term in this integral. Nor do we use relative velocity here. Let's define the different terms. This term is the total force, which is a vector acting on the control volume. This term represents the rate of change of linear momentum inside the control volume. Note that for a moving control volume, we are moving with the control volume. This represents the total rate of change within that control volume. And this area integral is the net rate of linear momentum flow out of the control volume. It turns out that for accelerating flows, you must keep this velocity as the absolute velocity. The reasons are complex and beyond the scope of this class. If the control volume is moving but not accelerating, and it's not distorting, in other words, changing shape, we also use relative velocity vr in this term. For this lesson, we make the following simplifications, assumptions, and approximations. We have well-defined inlets and outlets. We use the same momentum flux correction factor that we defined previously. As previously, we split total force into gravity, pressure, viscous, and other forces. And we will consider inertial reference frames only. That means that the control volume is not accelerating. In other words, it's moving at constant speed. In that case, this V is also the relative velocity or simplicity. So in our momentum equation, we write out all the forces as previously. Then we have the unsteady term. And we have this simplified version of the momentum flow rates across the surface. Notice that I added the relative subscript on m dot as well, since we're in an inertial reference frame. Here's our control volume moving at some velocity, vcv, which is constant. We have inlets and outlets, and we have some forces acting on the control volume. This is the only difference between our previous lesson and this one. So now we're ready for some examples. The first example is the same problem we did previously, except the plate is now moving at some speed vp instead of being stationary. This jet strikes the plate and spreads radially, and we want to find the force acting on this plate that's required to keep the plate moving at a constant speed. As previously, the first step is to pick a wise control volume. I want to cut through the outlets across the back of the plate and then slice through the jet. But this control volume is moving. The velocity of the control volume is the same as the velocity of the plate, which is VP magnitude to the right, which is the x direction. The second step is to use the x component of the equation I wrote above without the unsteady term, since this is a steady problem from the frame of reference of the moving control volume. As this plate moves to the right, our control volume moves with it. The relative mass flow rates and velocities simply mean that these are relative to our control volume as we're moving. What is ur in this equation? Well, ur is simply the x component of the velocity in the x direction, and it's u absolute minus u of the control surface, or that portion of the control surface where we're evaluating. For example, at the inlet, it's here. In our case, the entire control volume is moving at the same speed. So at the inlet, ur is the jet speed, vj, minus vp, where the control surface speed in the x direction is vp, the speed of the plate to the right. At the outlet, ur is zero in the x direction. You can see that here. Since our control volume is moving with the plate, the flow is coming out radially outward circumferentially in the z and y directions. But there's no component in the x direction. Now let's look at these terms. There's no gravity in the x direction. There's no pressure force because p is atmospheric pressure everywhere. In this control volume, pressure is the same on the left and on the right. It's even the same on the top and bottom. So all those pressure forces cancel out. There are viscous forces on the inside of this plate where the water is moving against it, but there are no viscous forces on our control volume because of our wise choice of control volume. The only other force is negative F, which we see here acting on the plate or acting on the control volume, which includes the plate. You are a zero at the outlet, so only two terms remain negative f and this inlet term. So our equation becomes, substituting in this ur at the inlet, we have negative f equal negative beta j m dot j times this relative speed in the x direction. Since this is an inertial reference frame, 
m dot j is rho of the water times the relative velocity coming in times the area of the jet. This is the mass flow rate entering our moving control volume. Since the control volume is moving, the speed entering the control volume is less than vj. In fact, it's vj minus vp. Putting all this together, we have f equal beta j rho water vj minus vp squared times aj. This is our answer in variables. If you compare to the result from the previous lesson, this is the same result except for this relative velocity term instead of just vj. If you think about it, since this is an inertial reference frame and we're moving with this control volume, we see the same problem as we saw last time, but with a slower velocity coming in. Now let's do another example. This one involves the force on a bucket of a Pelton-type impulse hydroturbine. A Pelton wheel is a type of turbine that spins due to a high-speed jet of water hitting these curved veins, which they call buckets. The water comes in and is deflected around. The bucket turns the flow approximately 180 degrees so that we get both the impact of the jet and then another force by this momentum flux going backwards. In this problem, we want to calculate the force of the bucket on the turbine wheel, which I'll call F bucket on wheel, at the instant in time when the bucket is in the position shown, namely at the bottom. We take our control volume around this bucket, and we're assuming that S is very small compared to capital R. I drew the control volume in a larger fashion here. We want to calculate the force of the bucket on the wheel, but on our control volume we have the equal and opposite force, which I call F wheel on bucket. This control volume is moving at speed omega R, where where omega is the angular velocity and capital R is the radius, where again capital R is large compared to this distance s. So this is an approximation. At inlet 1 we have the jet speed, the jet area, and beta of the jet. There are viscous forces as this thing wraps around, and by the time we get to the outlet, this jet may be smaller or larger, probably spread out quite a bit, and will have a different speed, different area of the exit, and a different beta. We approximate this as an inertial reference frame. It's not an inertial reference frame because it's rotating, so this is an approximation. But dealing with the non-inertial frame is beyond the scope of the present analysis. Again, since our control volume is moving to the right at this instant in time, we deal with relative velocities. Let's calculate those relative velocities. In general, vr is v minus v of the control surface at inlets and outlets. At 1, which is our inlet, vr is vj i, since it's in the x direction, minus omega r i, since the control volume is also moving in the x direction. This drawing is not to scale, since this jet speed will be larger than omega r. So the x component of relative velocity at the inlet is vj minus omega r. This is the speed that our control volume sees coming in at the inlet. Now let's use conservation of mass. We'll approximate the water as incompressible as usual, and even though this is not an inertial reference frame, we'll call it quasi-steady at the instant being examined when that bucket is at the bottom of the wheel. Keep in mind that this is an approximation. Our conservation of mass equation is thus sigma in m dot relative equal sigma out m dot relative. Well, there's only one inlet and one outlet, so this becomes rho vr in a in equal rho vr out, a out. The densities cancel, and we had an expression for vr in previously, namely vj minus omega r. a in is the jet area. We don't know what vr out is, but we know the exit area. So we solve for vr out. vr out is vj minus omega r times aj over ae. Note that we're now dealing with speeds, not velocities. Speed, of course, is the magnitude of velocity. This is a scalar equation. The x component of the outlet velocity is ur2, and it's the negative of this magnitude since the outlet flow is in the opposite direction, in other words, in the negative x direction from our original diagram. So ur2 is negative of vr out. This is the x component of the relative velocity at outlet 2. Now let's plug ur1 and ur2 into to our momentum equation. I typed up the x component of the steady linear momentum equation for a moving control volume here. Again, several terms drop out. There's no gravity in the x direction. P equal P atmosphere everywhere, so that term goes away. There are viscous forces along the inside of the bucket, but we made a wise choice of control volume that does not include those viscous forces. Fx other is the force we're trying to calculate. 
which we called F bucket on wheel. There's only one inlet and one outlet, so we don't need the sigmas. At the outlet, beta is beta E, and then we have M dot R, U R 2. And at the inlet with the negative sign, we have beta J, M dot R, U R 1. Where we evaluate M dot R at the inlet, rho times VJ minus omega R, the relative speed in the x direction, times AJ. We solve for this term, so moving it to the left, F bucket on wheel equal rho VJ minus omega R squared, AJ times the quantity beta J plus beta E AJ over AE, where we've substituted our expressions for UR2 and UR1. This is our answer in variable form. It's the force of one bucket acting on the turbine wheel at the instant in time when the jet is aligned with the bucket. Keep in mind that this is only an approximation, since we're treating this as an inertial reference frame when it's not. But it's a reasonable approximation for the case with small buckets and a large wheel. Wheel. Part B asks for the power delivered to the turbine wheel. We'll call that W dot wheel. It would be the torque times the magnitude of the angular velocity. The torque is the force we calculated times r. A more accurate result would be r plus s over 2, but we've ignored s compared to r. And angular velocity is omega. Plugging in our force from this equation up here, we get the power delivered to the wheel is rho vj minus omega r squared aj times the quantity beta j plus beta e aj over ae times r omega. So that's our answer in variable form. Again, keep in mind that this is an approximate answer. We can do another interesting analysis here from an engineering point of view. What omega should we run this wheel at to get maximum power? If we plot omega wheel from this equation as a function of omega, when omega is zero, w dot wheel is zero. So there's a data point. When omega r is equal to vj, w dot wheel is again zero. That would be when omega is vj over r. And we have another data point. And the plot plot would look something like this, where at some omega, I'll just call it omega 1, w dot wheel is a maximum at omega 1. Physically, thinking about our moving control volume, if the wheel's not rotating, we have no power because there's no motion. Power has to involve both forces and motion. At the other extreme, if omega r is the same as vj, the bucket doesn't feel any impact from the jet. And somewhere in between these two extremes, we find our maximum power. This is the omega where the operators would want to run this Pelton wheel. I emphasize that this is only an approximation. To repeat this problem using a non-inertial reference frame would be more difficult. It is beyond the level of this course. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.